Hello guys, hope you all had a good day. I'm Shrilika from Professional Health. So today we are here to discuss about accidental dental and facial deformities. As we all know that, face is the part which is mostly affected during road traffic accidents and it is the part that people are more conscious about. So to discuss all these things, today we have our guest of the day who is Dr. Santosh, who is a pedodontist and currently working as assistant professor at Government Dental College and Hospital Preventer. Good evening and a warm welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Good yes. evening, sir. Yeah. Good evening. Go on. Sir, we keep hearing from our staff and seniors, sir. They keep getting calls at midnight about emergencies and the patients come with broken cases. Broken faces. So, what if such patient walks into your clinic with temporal mandibular joint dislocation? How do you treat them, sir? Okay, I'll do one thing. I'll share my screen. Okay, we'll sure. start the presentation. Are you able to see this? Yes, sir. Okay. I'll go on. Yeah, are you expecting anyone? We can continue, sir. Okay. Thank you. So we'll be uh, starting with the first question regarding temporal manual joint. And uh, as uh, you, you can see, this one is a normal uh, TM joint features uh, when it is closed and when it is open. See the movement of the joint. Uh, before going into the pathological part, we, we have to see how this normally works. These both uh, pictures uh, depicts the normal uh, status. First one uh, where the cursor is situated is in the TMG in the closed position. Okay, see this is the mandibular condyle and top of this is the articular disc and uh, there is the eminence and while opening it is a full uh, normal opening and here the position um, is changed towards forward and downward so the briefly the movement of uh, condylar joint is uh, uh, divided into two first one a small opening if you have a or say about 10 uh, or 15 mm, it will be in the hinge type joint. And uh, later on, if you open mouth widely, uh, that will be uh, in, in, in the translation moment or a sliding moment. That's what uh, it is shown back. But when the problem comes, uh, when a trauma occurs in uh, in the mandible uh, with a blunt instrument. Uh, blunt instrument. One sec. Uh, uh, trauma occurs with a blunt instrument to the chin. Uh, it causes uh, concussion or either fracture of the contact. Uh, either unilateral or bilateral. When it occurs in unilaterally, we have a deviation to the same side. You point to be not an action. Actually, it's an MCQ question. Uh, it deviates to the affected side. But uh, if it occurs bilaterally, you have got an anterior open bite. Okay. So uh, that's a good fracture thing. But when you uh, come across a dislocation of the TMJ, we can uh, manage it immediately by doing this manual. Uh, this uh, it is written as precis premolar. That's wrongly written. Actually, the po most posterior tooth, which will be the molar, should be pressed. See, you can see the arrow 
first it should be downwards so that this articular um, condyla head will move downwards so it will clear the hum of this eminence and then you should go uh, move the man, uh, mandible backwards so that it will reach the articular space that's how you manage dislocation um, uh, in an emergency manner but uh, the problem occurs when the patient comes to you after a few days or um, many hours then you will have a problem with doing this manner because the, uh, the patient is already under uh, may have swelling and also spasm will be there so the muscles won't yield much uh, for that okay and uh, one uh, one more thing I, uh, I have to add uh, uh, about TMJ uh, um, uh, condyla joint fractures is that if uh, it occurs uh, in ch childhood or something or is even in adult, uh, yeah, the best treatment would be a conservative approach. If you open the uh, TM joint, there is high chance there is ankylosis will occur. So. If there is a minimal occlusal derangement, we will leave like that, even if our unilateral um, fractures of condyle. But if bilateral you know, condyles are fractured and then you have a um, greater amount of occlusal derangement, you have no other choice than to open uh, the area. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was great information. So our next question is, what is how will you treat the maxilla or mandible breakage or fracture? Okay, actually, that uh, most of this, uh, uh, the maxilla fracture thing is a big uh, topic. And before going into that um, treatment part, we should first uh, uh, know how to examine the um, heart tissue of the area. And uh, before that, we should clinically assess the patient whether they have got any respiratory airway issues or any uh, head injuries or any uh, chest injuries which uh, which uh, uh, should be addressed first before we do uh, this. This thing, uh, it can wait. That's the important part of triage. And uh, most of the students, when re you will reach the internship program you will be uh, knowing that which should be which area should be given priority for example you some will someone will come with a little finger fracture first you know what should we do you should go in for the skull fracture so while examining the patient see first of all uh, we should examine the uh, uh, superior and inferior orbital rim we should palpate the uh, rim. Just follow this cursor like this. We are checking for discontinuity. Before all this thing, we should examine ourselves. We should find out uh, what is normal. Then only you can find out the abnormalities. Okay. So we should uh, check the superior as well as inferior orbital con uh, continuity. And then this lateral line of zygoma, zygomatic arch as well as zygo, zygomatic buttress, then we should check whether the nasal septum is intact. Uh, we'll find out uh, whether if there is any uh, fracture, we'll find out, uh, we'll find a crepitus. Don't bother whether the patient is having got any pain or they will have tenderness uh, if there is a fracture. But most important part is first you have to diagnose it. So don't bother about it. That you will clinically will learn uh, by this. Then you have to uh, check the uh, maxilla. That is you should insert three fingers inside the mouth on the upper arch on the anterior region. And then you have to move the try to move the maxilla. If it is fractured, it will move, otherwise it will be intact only. Then you have to check uh, inside the sulcus, upper sulcus, buccal and as well as labial sulcus, you have to check for discontinuity. Okay. 
then you have to uh, the, it is not mentioned here then he has to check the continuity of the mandibular lower border okay that's what how you uh, examine uh, the bone and and i'll tell you uh, more about in mandibular section okay can anyone uh, identify this condition it is written as raccoon's eyes can anyone say what uh, which condition you will find out took 5 to 10 second loss eyes sir uh, it's uh, you it, it can be seen in many condition but in trauma it is mostly associated with basal bone fractures like spinoid ethmoid or temporal like that it's actually uh, the photograph of my eyes only <laughs> when i got an uh, injury to the frontal vessels you now while doing an uh, frontal nerve block uh, i got this raccoon sign so we'll move on to the maxillary fractures actually mainly the, it is divided uh, it is classified into three you have got subdivision that we can learn uh, later uh, i will cover only leaf foot 1 2 3 leaf foot as classified maxillary fractures into uh, three types leaf foot 1 leaf foot 2 leaf foot 3 and this is based on the uh, fractal line which is passing through different uh, bones so first uh, leaf foot 1 leaf to leaf foot one as uh, in the picture you can see the whole of the upper segment the teeth bearing segment is fractured see below the nasal cavity the fracture line extends from the piriform aperture through the lateral maxillary and lateral nasal walls to the posterior region it may include the pterygoid plate also okay and uh, you have a clinical uh, feature uh, uh, which is a classical thing which uh, is given in the intraoral picture and uh, marked by a circle you can see an ecchymosis can you say and uh, can you tell which area is this anyone past soft palate <laughs> uh soft palate is, is a little uh, um, posteriorly this specific area is the area where you can find the greater palatine foramen that area will be having ecchymosis that's the cardinal feature of leaf foot one fracture and that's called gurin sign it's also an mcq and while you palpate the um, Oh, oh, you, while you oh, you tap with a blunt instrument to the upper teeth, you you will hear a cracked pot sound. Actually, that sound uh, we can uh, find out in your houses if your uh, tiles in your bathrooms or in your house. It's not uh, uh, properly made. You will have an air uh, air cushion inside the tile. Then you will you, if you tap it, you will have a Uh, that cra exact cracked pot sound. If you experience that, really nice. And this uh, one more thing is this uh, type of fracture occurs when the, a blunt force hits the uh, maxilla above the root apices here, where I my uh, cursor is there. Okay. Next, we'll move on to leaf foot two. and leaf or two is other another they have lots of name for this another name is pyramidal fracture the you can see that this uh, fracture line has moved higher up so the forces occur at the glabella and downwards this force will cause the uh, leaf or two type of fracture which extends pterygoid plate through the maxilla it is uh, which is in the posterior of this maxilla and through the nasal orbital uh, ethmoidal area and na nasal frontal bone it may uh, involve uh, infra orbital foramen or may not and the cardinal feature is moon face you will see the moon face uh, you know, because these all this area will be uh, involved and you have got a swelling so 
this whole malar region will be uh, uh, puffed up and will have a moon phase you can google it and see how it is and there will be step defect in this uh, infraorbital margin but um, just to remember i have told first you have to palpate the rims for continuity and another feature is csf brain area csf brain area you have will get a, a rhinitis some some sort of thing but it will be a, a diluted blood that that is actually csf which is coming through the nose the cribriform plate will be uh, broken because of this fracture and then you will have leaking of csf there is a greater chance of meningitis in this type of fracture and uh, next we will go into lefort 3 fracture uh can anyone say which uh, zain is this in the picture a picture a fast fast okay no problem uh the lefo tree as at uh, said it is a uh, the name is craniofacial disc uh, distension fracture which goes higher up and uh, i'd add uh, a few uh, points uh, regarding fractures this uh, this whole mid face that is above this mandible and below this um, uh, frontal bones it is called um, mid face and the mid face is considered as a matchbox and the mandible is considered as a uh, hockey stick because uh, because of the density of the bone say uh, you can find in many texts at uh, mid face it acts as a bonnet of a car that is a crumble zone it is designed to uh, bear the brunt um, bear the force or uh, any uh, brunt force but it will have a, a damaging uh, thing on the aesthetics but patient will survey so that uh, if the mid face bones were harder that impact will be more felt on the Uh, brain and uh, other important structures on the posterior part of that that's why this is it's called a mac match box type of thing okay then the picture i have shown it is a battle sign which is a peri uh, mastoid ecchymosis seen posterior to the pinna you can see uh, in this mri also there is Uh, light radiolucency area compared to the other structures which is uh, uh, the hemorrhage intra cranial hemorrhage see the third c picture also you can see this occurs in lefort three fracture and many other conditions like middle cranial uh, fractures you might come across some cases in uh, casualty the patient has uh, got no signs of any trauma or so but the patient will have bleeding from his ears that's only sign that implies the middle cranial fossa middle cranial uh, fossa there is fracture and it has breached the uh, tympanic cavity okay and in, uh, in this uh, kind of leaf for three type of fractures we get panda faces and both eyes are black and we have a dish face dish face is in the sense you have got the fracture of all the uh, mid face region so you don't get the prominence of the zygoma so we have a dish uh, type of uh, picture and uh, another cardinal feature i am just going for only the cardinal features rest all are given in the text next thing is a anti mongoloid slant don't get confused i'll show you see in this picture first one is a mongoloid slant which is seen in down syndrome and this anti mongoloid slant is see the opposite of this thing 
it's going like this inward downward this is laterally and downward why this occurs is up see you can just figure out these uh, you have got fracture of the mid face so the um, uh, sigma both side is going down so that will pull the tissues and every muscles are attached to the skin or in the facial region so it explains that okay so oh. that oh, that was all about uh, maxilla now we will come into uh, come to mandible see mandible um we you have one two three four five areas of uh, where the chances of fracture can occur as i have told earlier it's a it's just like a um acts as a hockey stick because it's very hard but only thing this neck area is weak why because when this trauma occurs in the chin this uh, neck will give way but if here it if it was in the neck region if it were uh, harder then this uh, bone will go into the middle cranial fossa it will create it cause more damage that's why uh, this is designed like this okay best uh, area is the symphysis factor that is the middle midpoint of the mandible next is the parasymphysal uh, region and the other part is the angle this is a ramus and this is a condyle and this one is a coronoid fossa and it said that uh, coronoid uh, condylar and angular fracture are uh, uh, at higher incidence okay now some features of this mandibular fracture clinically uh, cardinal, cardinal feature of parasymphysis fracture is sublingual hematoma see we'll see hematoma in the floor of mouth and uh, if the fracture occurs in the body you will have paresthesis or anesthesia because inside this this inferior alveolar nerve is passing through that will be damaged and uh, in if it's a dento alveolar thing that then dento alveolar fracture is occurring then you will have uh mobility of teeth and if it occurs in the ramus region you will have tristness tristness is a uh, difficulty in opening mouth because the mesenteric muscles will be attached here myeloid will be attached in the medial side so you will have pterygoid muscles will be attached in the uh, medial side so you will have uh, tristness and, uh, regarding the treatment part of maxillomandibular fractures are um as a, a rule of thumb you have to manage conservatively most of the times and many times it, uh, you have to do an open reduction open reduction and uh, uh, depends on many factors including the age of the patient and the damage which has occurred the derangement of occlusion and uh, problem with uh, uh, leafwood tree fracture is no uh point of reference is there every bone is fractured so we have to take the occlusion as a criteria and build up from there so the treatment part can be an open reduction or the closed reduction closed reduction uh, means you don't have to do the sur surgery part you have to do an uh, intermaxillary fixation using uh, wiring uh, uh, connecting both the uh, arches like this and we can do if the mandibular fracture occurs circum mandibular wiring like sort of things or if the uh, mandible if the sigma is fractured we can uh, elevate it from the uh, temporal region like this and regarding the open reduction and uh, it actually it's a post graduate level thing but i'll tell you some few things you have to open up the thing if uh, occlusal uh, derangement is Uh, it is large and it's difficult to manage conservatively you have to think about uh, intermax and uh, no uh, open reduction and the open reduction is more suitable to the adult patient rather than the 
a child patient and you will go uh, for a uh, plates steel plates or titanium plates you will uh, you put on the uh, butter area and you will screw it that's how it is treated and then if uh, you have an edentulous mouth or an old age do you don't have any teeth to fix any of the teeth you have to go for a calf splint and that uh, calf splint is nothing but an acrylic plate will be which is fitted and the upper and lower jaw and it will be tied with wire so that the occlusion uh, remains stable the and we will build on above that okay and this is this is a case which came to me the child was 5 year old and she got fracture in the body of the mandible so we have done a procedure under ga we have done circum uh, mandibular wiring see you can see the step defect in the lower part of the mandible so we have made a uh, calf splint uh, thing of uh, a splint type of thing with an acrylic and uh, i have put a wire so, so that we to reinforce it and then we will uh, try it in the patient's mouth and we'll do the wiring and uh, actually we don't open the flap we will take this wire and uh, some uh, take uh, rotate in do through the lower border and we'll tie up here okay okay that's what about uh, maxilla and mandibular fractures thank you sir it's a very vast knowledge you got so our next question is very interesting can fracture tooth fragments be attached if it is done what are the advantages and disadvantages the patient face see no fracture the uh, um before going into to fracture teeth i'll just tell you about the classification of a fracture teeth it is an uh, ellis and davis classification and it is uh, it uh, we have got nine i have not included the ninth one and we have got nine and the first one is a fracture of enamel second enamel and dentin third enamel dentin exposing pulp fourth is no, uh, trauma which causes uh, which uh, causes the tooth to become non vital and fifth is avulsion tooth is uh, away from the socket and sixth is a root fracture and the seventh is displacement of the tooth towards laterally and medially uh, anteriorly posterior anyway like that and uh, uh, type 8 is fracture of the crown end mass and the type uh, class 9 of this uh, ellis classification is the trauma of the primary teeth this eight thing was was uh, telling about the permanent teeth okay, you asked about the um, reattachment of the tooth the advantage of this uh, reattachment is that the patient uh, will be traumatized psychologically the child may be uh, usually 8 or 9 years that's some greatest um, chance they have got for the trauma because they will be playing and like that and the tooth will be just coming out and that they will fracture and come so they will have an a psychological effect on this the how will you they they face their friends or so like that so immediate reattachment of this is a temporary solution or an interim thing we will do it so that and uh, the parent as well as the patient will psychologically benefit them so but the definitive treatment is uh, different that depend on the prognosis of the tooth whether the tooth is just uh, has got a concussion or just got a dentinal problem it has a no root fracture no pulp is involved like that we will uh, 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 plan accordingly so this is a picture showing the first uh, central incisor or one one will denoted in the fd system one one it has got an enamel fracture while the two one or second that uh, other incisor left side incisor has got central incisor has got a class 2 fracture see it's built up with the composite we have done it so better to do definitive treatment at a later day probably one or two weeks so that the patient has got 
on and, and resolved all the immediate soft tissue issues and so see it's another example this is a class 3 fracture which is involving the pulp enamel dentin and pulp and this is a, an example of a, a class 8 where we have got the loss of crown structure so see in the radiograph you will see the radiolucent line so you will do you will uh, take out the small part and what we do we do a surgical extrusion that is we will raise the flap and then attach a bracket on this the remaining tooth structure and uh, later we will uh, do a orthodontic appliance and then pull the tooth to a um, two or three mm so that we will get enough tooth structure to build a post and coron so next is avulsion that uh, this i have uh, reimplanted the tooth so we have to go for a splinting with uh, stainless steel and composite and it will kept for 10 days or so this one is an elis class 7 uh, uh, fracture which is a uh, tooth loss due to trauma and uh, we have to give a processes for the patient it just a removal process okay thank you yes sir so as you told that adults the tooth can be put back into the oral cavity what are the tips should be taken to preserve the vitality of the adults yeah very good question actually uh, i i i have always faced difficulty while treating the adults uh, avulsion because the patients will be most of them coming 8 9 10 years and the parents won't know whether that those teeth are permanent or not the permanent teeth will be uh, we will reimplant what that's a term we used to re um, to re reinsert the tooth and uh, they will they will most probably they will throw the tooth they will be playing the patient child will be playing somewhere in the dirt also they will throw it and they come so they don't have the awareness or oh, if they go to some other practitioner so they don't uh, uh, reinsert the uh, tooth the problem with the uh, avels to do this that the uh, cells covering the root of the uh, avels to will be viable for some time only at least uh, 5 to 20 minutes or so uh, below 30 minutes uh, after that that tissue will be damaged so the uh, that prognosis depends upon the time since avulsion so immediately if anyone even mbvs guys or bvs by anyone you come across the patient such a patient you just wash the clean the tooth uh, with the root with the saline running saline no no tap water should be used because the tissues will cells will be damaged so don't scrub the root also just um, clean the root and then reinsert it inside the um uh, this thing extracted or uh, socket removed socket reinsert back to the position and then refer to a periodontist or surgeon that's the immediate thing you should do when you come as, uh, come across the avels to and the other thing is that patient will be carrying the tooth in a dry state or they will cover in, in some uh, polythene cover or paper and will come but that it's it's not it's wrong you should it should be ideally it should be kept in uh, a, a ba hangs balance hbss hangs balance all solution if it is an available uh, market medical so it will be fine otherwise you will uh, should carry in a pasteurized milk or in saline anything it will do but don't carry in tap water or dried dieting and the other part of this in the treatment part will depend on the time as i have told if it is dry then we have to think about other modalities like we have to do rct uh, root canal treatment before inserting then you have to keep it off if it, it, you get it after uh, 72 hours or so thank you thank you sir
So, what are the most common emergencies you came across during your experience? Pardon me. What are the most common emergency cases you came across during your practice, sir? Most common is uh, one uh, type of tissue injury. Uh, or tooth injury, we will see class 1, class 2, class 3, like that, or avulsion. And also, if uh, I, when I was posted in the casualty, I will come across a mandibular fracture, maxillary fracture, sort of thing. But most common is tooth injury. That will be depending upon the age. If you are seeing the uh, patients uh, below 6 years, you will have an actually intrusion injury that the bone will be pliable and the tooth will go inside the bone or alveolus but we are seeing uh, after a permanent tooth has come out the tooth will be broken like that thank you thank you sir so coming to the dental infection what are the major dental infections that occur in children um okay uh, before that i would uh, I'll come across this uh, dental, I have to tell a few things about dental cases. Actually, uh, the uh, only major infection which we deal with is the odontogenic infection or uh, the infection which is generated from due to dental cavity. See, you uh, can see few pictures which I have shown you. See this one, the bottom left down, The uh, this is the First, first molar, permanent first molar, which has got a dentinal caries. And, and uh, uh, and uh, sorry, I that that's actually deciduous molar, second deciduous molar. And the, uh, this one is anterior to this is first deciduous molar, which has got pulp exposure or pulp, pulpitis. See on the right side, you can see the infection is deeper and you have got a swelling here. It's a, actually dendroalveal abscess. Then in the same picture, you can see the sequel from where the enamel caries, dendinal caries, pulp exposure, and then which lead on to the, uh, the, the dendroalveal abscess. And that may uh, de lead, lead on to rad radicular cyst or then or cellular. I will show you later. This is how you uh, uh, treat that patient. This, if the tooth is more, and this is another slide, another photograph, a post photograph, where the tooth was more damaged, so we cannot restore that. We will remove and maintain the space. And uh, which was uh, restorable, we restored and then uh, we uh, did an RCA root canal treatment and then we gave an next stainless steel crown. Okay, see, this is a, a dendro alveolar abs where the infection is not stopped at the stage of pulpitis and we wait for some time, then this will happen. The, pus, uh, the infection will reach the bone and it will be resolved, then the whole area uh, become pus. So the ideal treatment is, is do an IND, put under the antibiotic coverage and extract the tooth. Okay, this is a post, uh, immediate post-operative picture, the second one. See, other one. The patient has got a history of trauma a uh, few months back or so. Yeah. She has some 11, 12, 11 years or so. See, in the radiograph, you can see whole big lesion, which is radiolucency on the left side of maxilla. This is an occlusal, upper occlusal radiograph. See, involving 2, 1, 2, 2, and 2, 3. Uh, we have to uh, do a uh, open procedure under LA, local anesthesia. When I opened the flap, I saw already the bone was damaged because of this cyst. So this cyst was big enough to create problem, we can leave the patient like that. See, yeah, yeah, papilla preservation flap was raised and we did cyst nucleation. See, this big was the cyst and it was immediate post operation. Now, another case of radicalis in the manual involving 7475. 
see this this two three seven five uh, second left deciduous molar see the radiograph you have can see a big lesion which uh, is involving both teeth and it extends till the developing premolar this is the developing premolar but we have to enucleate it and curettage was done this was the specimen we got after surgery and this one uh, the first picture is showing if you are not um, treating the dendroalveolar abscess there then it can lead to cellulitis this is a cellulitis we are seeing and mostly this upper tooth will be infected and we, you can see this much swelling coming to the patient the immediate thing is if there is pus you have to put a drainage of the pus and then you have to put the patient in antibiotic coverage don't send the patient you have to admit the patient and then extract the tooth the second day or uh, third day the second picture is a dangerous condition it's called a ludwig's angina and uh, which is caused due to an infected lower mandibular or mandibular teeth and which involved the first submandibular uh, region then extend to the sublingual region and extends to the whole uh, neck and later on if you wait for one day or few hours the patient can uh, develop laryngeal edema and that will be uh, uh, causing risk to the patient thank you thank you sir so what is cracked tooth syndrome and what are the causes signs and symptoms of it actually cracked tooth syndrome is nothing but a fractured vertically fractured tooth and we cannot um, diagnose properly when the patient will come and tell you that the patient is got pain while biting or so but the cardinal uh, diagnosis we will get is by uh, allowing the patient to chew a rubber um bottle cap of the local anesthesia we get if you chew that rubber thing the it is it has got a resiliency and uh, you the cusp which is broken that will move or slide around the other other thing the broken part will just to slide around that that will cause is crucial in to pay, pain to the patient and we can diagnose the cracked tooth and uh, see it can call it is called due to the natural wear because uh, in, in seen in old patients uh, after time the pa patient will erode all the uh, occlusal enamel uh, thing and will get uh, cracks or if the patient is got habits of clenching or bruxism while sleeping or otherwise and uh, some uh, habits and the trauma Uh, large fillings, untreated uh, tooth decay, everything can cause cracked tooth syndrome. And uh, you have to diagnose properly the identify the tooth. The difficult part is identifying the tooth. Then you won't get any uh, um, marks in the radio uh, radiographs. That's a difficult part. Then you have to do a uh, probably you have to do an root canal treatment or conservative approach. And, and then you have to give a crown to uh, have a definitive treatment of that thank you thank you sir so as we all know that restoration is the major treatment done to all the dental caries what are the infections caused due to the over uses of the filling material uh, pardon me the what's the last part over filling you use over usage of filling material Infections oh. positive. Over usage mean over filling. Yes, sir. Ah, over filling. Okay, thank you. The over filling, uh, the patient will come to you uh, after root canal treatment or so after uh, normal restoration. They will tell you, I can't chew with that too. It's hurting me like hell. They will tell you that. But you will be you know, panicked. So what? It's long like that. nothing just check the occlusion of the patient so we have to do an uh, um you have got an articulating paper sort of thing which has a, got a dye imprinted on it 
and ask the patient to bite on it. So color will be marked on the high points of the restoration or anywhere. Then you will just just have to smoothen that thing, and the patient will uh, tell once you remove it. Ah, uh, doctor, it's okay now. That's the thing. How you manage the high points? And the problem with uh, if you leave that uh, patient like that, no, that uh, thing will damage the. Uh, periodontium of the teeth and will cause infections. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, could you please explain? Does nail biting in children cause the difficulty in eruption of the teeth? Nail biting. Yes, sir. Uh, nail biting. Uh, the problem we have identified that the nail biting will cause erosion of the teeth. We we'll get, get a uh, crescent-shaped uh, area uh, uh, over the uh, crescent-shaped erosion of the upper and is or lower and is for in a chronic uh, nail biters. But this thing uh, which uh, uh, prevents the eruption, it's not. Uh, we don't. We have not come across, or I have not seen in any literature also. Thank you, sir. Sir, so as there are so many non-dental students here, could you please yeah. explain the importance of oral hygiene? Yeah, sure. See, I brought this slide uh, for uh, you people to note them. This is how uh, we uh, tell the patient to practice brushing. This is uh, actually modified BAS technique, BAS technique for brushing. Usually, it is practiced uh, advice for adults. For for uh, children, you have to uh, go in for a circular method or phones technique. I'll tell about this technique. See in the first picture, the uh, you have to uh, brush the teeth separately, upper jaw as well as lower jaw. Usually, what uh, layman will do is just to scrub the teeth. Like we clean the toilet, <laughs> so so it's not the proper way. You have to do brushing for every each and every tooth separately. See, you are keeping the bristles in a fortified. Just uh, look at the first picture and the cursor. It is uh, kept uh, in a fortified degree angle to the uh, at the junction of the gums as well as the teeth, and then we have to go a downward force so that this. The brie plaque will come down. This is how we do. This is the basic principles of this bar technique. We will go on upper anteriors and the buccal part and inside occlusal part. See the fifth picture. We'll clean the tooth like this. See inside the lingual part. We have to clean like this. See. But uh, the problem is that you are. You can clean whatever uh, area which is accessible to the brush, but not in between the two. See, in between it will really be difficult. So I have, we have to do flossing. And before going for uh, telling more about flossing, I'll tell you, brushing twice daily is uh, more important and most important part is brushing at night. Rather than in the morning, because after having all this thing, we will be sleeping with this mouth, and when the mouth and bacteria will have what ample time to create colonies during our sleep. That a night part is very important. We should ideally brush twice daily. Books us and uh, literature is saying you have to brush after every meal, but um, it's not practically possible. At least you have to uh, wash your Or clean your mouth with water after having any type of food, and then you have to avoid in between snacks. Or you are, if you are want to eat a snack, you know sweets or something, you have to uh, eat during a regular meal so that you will have uh, you can you are able to clean it properly. Otherwise, that will uh, remain there and it will cause dental plaque to accumulate. See the flossing. Flossing, you will get uh, it's uh, some something uh, around uh, cost you seventy or eighty rupees in uh, from the medical store. And it's a long thread, 
probably uh, some 60 70 meters long you have to uh, take some 60 centimeters of one uh, one session and do after night brushing after fl flossing you don't need uh, don't uh, eat anything you have to hold like this uh, tie in one uh, a ring finger of one hand and and other part in uh, other hand so uh, you have to take a fresh piece of thread for each and every two see just see the uh, second picture you have to move to and fro movement but don't go deep into the gums that will uh, damage it just go inside and do to and fro and just take this out so that the debris will come out this is how you do it. okay thank you thank you sir so we have come to the end of the session now let's go to the down session participants can put on your questions in the chat sir okay So what can be done if a person follow his own food? Yeah, uh, that's not a big deal. The problem uh, will occur only once that uh, tooth go inside the lungs or trachea. Now, if he, he swallows, just observe the patient for 24 hours or 48 hours so that he pass the uh, it in stool. You just need to check whether it has passed the uh, respiratory tract. But that uh, we can come to know because uh, you will have a uh, severe distress if you have swallow and it go inside, aspirate inside the lungs. Otherwise, they won't have any problem. If they come to you and say that the patient, uh, I am, I have swallowed the tooth, then then itself you know he is safe. But the only thing that you have to observe the uh, patient. So there is another question from our participant. Okay. How frequently should we floss our teeth? How frequently? Just to do it at least once. After your dinner, you brush the teeth and then do the flossing. But does the tooth decay leads to hot and other internal problems? Is it a fact or a myth? Pardon me, does the tooth decay? A tooth decay leads to a leads to hot and other internal problems. Is this a fact or a myth? You mean to say heart problem? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's not a myth. It's true. In patients uh, who have got a history of rheumatic fever, they will have some antigens or antibodies inside the uh, circulating blood. So uh, if, if you have got a tooth infection that will create bacteremia and which will cause the bacteria to flow inside the circulation and that will come to the damage, already damaged uh, um, uh, valves and they will attach there and uh, cause damage to the wall that will lead on to infective endocarditis that's the reason why if uh, you are treating a cardiac patient with the valvular processes or something like that or they have a history of rheumatic fever then you have to go for infective endocarditis prophylaxis before any procedure at, at least uh, 30 minutes before the procedure that the uh, that will be the prescription will be given by the uh, cardiologist of the concerned patient so that it will prevent the bacteremia during any extractions or during any infection or during any procedures we will be doing that's a um, very riskier thing if you just mildly ignore the thing or uh, while extracting also that the extraction procedure will itself create a bacteremia that will cause great damage to the valve and that is riskier to the patient. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So what is done when a part of the bone is lost during road traffic accident? 
uh, part of the bond is uh, that depends on the um, um, immediate management anything as i have covered but that depends on the aesthetic, aesthetic part of the thing aesthetic if the damage is more if it is affecting the functions or if affecting the uh, aesthetics you can go in for uh, a graph a graph from the uh, graph might be maybe taken from the ribs or the anterior um, posterior iliac uh, the iliac bone or iliac crest bone also uh, we can you can harvest a uh, graft and put on the thing that we have done uh, many procedures for that otherwise you will uh, sometimes uh, for the mandible we may uh, go in for a, a titanium uh, reconstruction um, plate or so we'll put on that otherwise uh, if we both things we can go in but the thing is that uh, whether this uh, procedure the procedure itself is in and um uh, yeah surgical procedure itself is an actually an um, invasive one so if the you have to re judge regarding the risk benefit ratio whether we will achieve such effect that the aesthetic part uh, we were more concerned about the um, functional parts and if it's aesthetic is more of concern we will think about the graphs thank you thank you sir Sir, does topical application of anesthesia release the prick pain of the patient? <laughs> uh, that's a very uh, nice question. Actually, uh, since I am dealing with kids, kids uh, for some, even for one year kid, I have done uh, root canal pulpectomy or root canal treatment with, uh, uh, with an LA. The problem with that, even for uh, us also, adults also, the sight of the syringe is causing great anxiety than the, rather than the um, prick itself. So if you give a uh, uh, topical anesthesia, that will cause a mild uh, numbness in the area before the uh, uh, prick. But the prick itself, actually, it's uh, more painless. The anxiety part will create the uh, or decrease the, the pain threshold and we will we'll anticipate more pain. But then we will feel uh, uh, this, this much only, like that, no? That's the thing. Thank you, sir. Sir, why midline diastemia occurs in most of the patients? Uh, the midline diastema, actually, it is a uh, it can be pathological as well as physiological physiological in the sense you can get mis um, uh, that the other name for that physiological midline diastema is uh, ugly duckling state that we will find out in find in, in nine eight uh, ten eleven years before the eruption of canines permanent canines See, before the eruption of canines, that will the canines are placed higher up in the maxilla that will come down, that will hit the um, lateral insert, so that will uh, move laterally, and that in turn will hit the roots of the uh, central insert, and that will move away. So we'll get a, uh, a midline diastema as well as lateral divergence of this lateral incisors. But that will be once created, once this uh, permanent canines will be erupted. And the second part of that, that is the pathological part, which is caused due to a fibrous uh, or, or a, a thicker maxillary frenum. The frenum is a thin uh, line of uh, mucosa covering, uh, attaching to the uh, tooth between the central insert that will be harder and that will contain fibers that will flow uh, pass fibers inside the uh, uh, palate so that pull will cause the tooth to diverge and that will cause um, midline diastem that we need to uh, do the surgery remove the uh, we do the fibro phrenectomy then we will go for the um, orthodontic alignment of the two. That's uh, how it is approached. Oh, sorry, one more thing I missed out. 
Uh, another reason for the um, midline diastema is any supernumerary teeth present in between the tooth. Usually, some uh, most commonly mesiodents or something uh, tooth-like structure will be between the tooth. We have to take a radiograph to assess whether that it is there. If it's there, you have to remove the uh, two uh, super mesiodents or supernumerary teeth, and then you have to go for orthodontic correction. Thank you. So, can the impact in the anterior part of the face affect the emissary veins and damages the brain? Anterior impaction. Trauma you are speaking about. Can an impact in the anterior part of the face affect the emissary veins and damage the brain? Emissary veins you are talking about. Is it, pardon me, is it emissary veins? Yes, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's uh, I have shown that uh, picture like this now, and there is a. Uh, this is the dangerous area of face. We have got connection through uh, retinal veins and uh, emissary veins coming through the brain coming through the skull. So we have got cross connection also. That will create a, a, um, a channel for infection to go inside. That's a problem for this type of infection. If you are not addressing it properly, it can erode the structures or it can cause uh, bacteria to be implanted inside the brain and it cause meningitis and that is a more serious condition. And also, I have uh, mentioned it in the LIFO 2 and 3 fracture. There, is, um, there might be a breach of cribriform plate of the upper nasal roof, and that will cause meningitis. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, how should we handle trauma in little area of the face? Can anesthesia be given in that face? In that area, so. See, anesthesia, uh, see, uh, if you have got such a trauma coming to you, uh, the more important part is to stabilize the patient. And uh, if, uh, if a minor laceration sort of thing, you have to think about anesthesia and no problem. You have to uh, control the bleeding by purely packing the uh, area. I have uh, an experience, um, one of my seniors um, uh, treated a patient for palatal uh, laceration. The patient died, in, uh, died there in the chair itself. How it is that they actually ignored the posterior nasal bleed? That's the thing which I have told um, in the beginning. The trauma of uh, maxillofacial region should be evaluated. First, you should look for any other uh, neural injuries or skull injuries or uh, uh, rib fracture, chest injuries like that or airway damage and uh, bleeding from the posterior nasal thing. That everything you have to deal, pri give priority and deal it. Otherwise, you will be uh, doing a perfect um, suturing part of the lacerated wound on the face but the patient might die. This is a uh, problem uh, which will occur uh, if you uh, do like that. And then regarding the little, say, any, uh, any bleeding from inside the nasal cavity can be um, controlled with the packing, nasal, anterior nasal as well as posterior nasal packing. Thank you. Is there any emergency treatment which can be done at home for temporary relief before bringing the patient to the casual? Uh, I didn't get the first part of the question. Uh, trauma to where? To? For, lock, for a lock, sir. Is lock there any job. emergency? Yes. Uh, just, um, you just need to uh, uh, not to not try to open the mouth. It will create more uh, damage, uh, cause more damage to the TMJ. You just uh, if it is immediately happen, then just uh, uh, do a um, 
cold application and just visit the dentist if you have got any or surgeon you can and got any analgesics you can have it also but don't try anything at home thank you sir so uh, how can we manage roots extraction hemorrhage yeah that's a very uh, important topic before going for an extraction actually uh, technically the patient should be screened about uh, routine blood examination to screen any other blood dyscrasia including hemophilia sort of things if uh, if you even extract a mobile teeth in a patient with hemophilia the patient can die post uh, extraction with the post extraction bleeding we are all come across that thing so uh, you have if you have got a post extraction bleeding you have to find out whether the the plus blood picture is intact then you can go for uh, local measures like you can and do steps styptics or uh, you can uh, use gel form uh, you can uh, just cure the area and use the gel form and do a suturing that will pack the uh, wound nicely and bleeding won't occur and in between 20 seconds or 5 seconds a gap you can give a cold application or ice packing so that it will come down so you have to check if the bleeding occurs that's the reason why and not to send the patient immediately after procedure just to make the patient to sit in your waiting area for some time and then you uh, send the patient but for each and every patient you have to tell them what is the contingency if something occurs um, sometimes no this uh, uh, bleed and the bleed as well as the saliva will combine and it the patient uh, parent will feel that there is heavy bleeding might not be the case the a small bleeding which has been diluted by the saliva it seems like a big thing so everything you have to say before that and also ask the patient to bite the uh, cotton packing for half an hour not to uh, swish and swish uh, during that day not to have hot food or hot drinks on that day not to have straw juices Um, by drinking from the straw this all things to be prevented and for the kids also not to put any pencil pen or any other foreign objects inside the extraction that will cause the uh, clot which is already formed to dislodge and any then the fresh bleeding will occur the rest pathological part should be as i had told earlier should be addressed earlier and all the dyscrasia should be addressed properly even for the hemophilia child a lad and not that the hemophilic child can be um, uh, undergone extraction by uh, providing the fat rate concentrate you have to do the procedure within 40 minutes that's how we manage we will send the patient to the pediatrics the writing such and such procedure is to be done they will uh, put on the patient uh, with the fat rate concentrate and then send the back writing the time they have done like that 10 am they have given like that we will plan the procedure accordingly we will do it within 10:40 a that's how it goes on thank you thank you sir that's the end of the doubt session thank you sir for accepting our request and sharing your valuable time with us and clearing all our doubts thank you very much sir yeah thank you very much for uh, providing me this opportunity to have uh, to say few words uh, towards you Uh, to most of uh, I, I i have to add uh, one or two uh, things uh, most uh, mostly i think uh, most of them are third year students you have to read it properly you have to get at least one or two uh, standard textbooks and think about your future career uh, you about the pg uh, you have to think about it. you have to read your topics which is in the third year final year part one part two nicely you won't get able you won't get time to cover all these things uh, during your pg preparation if you have about a proper days thing you can uh, fly from uh, intensive itself thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir